Good afternoon and welcome to today's vital conversation with our community, Indomitable Strength, the strength of spirit, the strength of artistic expression, a conversation between Interfaith Ministries and the Ensemble Theater. Interfaith Ministries is pleased to be able to host these virtual conversations on topics with people and organization in our community addressing crucial issues. We offer our thanks for the support of Sitco Petroleum as the sponsor of our whole 2021 series. Before I proceed, just a reminder that this event is being recorded. Thank you for all of us, for all of you joining us on Zoom. Please keep yourselves muted and please use the chat box to send me any questions along the way. We welcome as well those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Vital conversations emerged after the death of George Floyd, a son of Houston's Third Ward, uh, in May of 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In June, we brought our three amigos, Reverend William Lawson, Archbishop Joe Fiorenza, and Rabbi Sam Karf, into dialogue to begin this series. It would be the final time that the three amigos would be together in the same space as Rabbi Karf died that following August, about a year ago. A second summer conversation on allyship followed, and then we began our fall 2020 series with a conversation between four outstanding young leaders and how their generation is on the forefront of social change. Our second fall conversation, then our, our, our upcoming, the next fall conversation was with the Fifth Ward CRC and Center for Urban Transport. Uh, transformation, and we concluded the 2020 season with a vital conversation with scholars from Rice University's Houston Education Research Consortium. We began our 2021 series last month with a conversation with Ashley Johnson and Jonathan Brooks from Link Houston about transportation and equity. You can view that conversation on IM's YouTube page. Please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about uh, Interfaith Ministries and how to donate. At imgh.org, you can learn about our overall work in the community, and you can learn about our 2021 series. You'll have the opportunity to register for our upcoming Vital Conversations episode, including our upcoming September conversation with Project Curate. In the coming weeks, you'll also learn more about our October and December Vital Conversations, with October's focus on young leaders in our community and December focusing on health equity. You can also access a study guide that you can use with our five episodes from our 2020 Vital Conversation series. Today, our theme is the power of artistic expression. And let me share a, a personal story about why this conversation is important to me. Since I was young, the arts have been important to me. I played the violin and sang through my middle and high school years, and then sang in multiple choirs in college. I know personally that art in all its forms is a medium of expression of discovery, of identity, of freedom, of love, of what it means to be human in all of its limitations and its potential. I've been transformed through the act of creation and co-creation through the arts. It can be at the same time singularly individualistic and wholly communal. I have felt alive as a human being, connected with my fellow musicians, and connected with what I experience as the source of all creativity. Some may call that your muse. I will call it God. But when it comes to the intersection of art and culture of liberation and resistance, I didn't get a taste of this kind of art until one day, my first year at Georgetown University, many, many years ago, it was early 1990, I decided to attend a Friday night rehearsal of Georgetown's Gospel Choir. Trust me, I didn't stumble in there looking to get woke. This was the it's a black thing you wouldn't understand era of the early 1990s and I had no idea what I didn't understand. I was a goofy and awkward 18 year old half Asian from semi rural Wisconsin, where I didn't quite fit as there weren't that many Asians, but at Georgetown with many more students of Asian descent I didn't speak the source language I didn't speak in this case Chinese so I didn't really fit in there as well, and I'm sure not black. <laughs> I was just looking for places to belong as I was figuring out who I was. And this gospel choir community took me in, one of maybe three people who weren't Black in a room of maybe 50 students. It was there, though, that I learned something about the intersection of Blackness and art. I learned that when I sang these spirituals and gospel songs, I sang with them, but I also was missing something that I slowly learned through experience and dialogue. That's something was the power of art in the Black community as a mode of resistance, of liberation, of expression, of songs 
that had multiple layers and meanings. And while they weren't my songs or my history, I was enwrapped and enveloped in these voices and songs and narratives. The first time I sang the words, I've been buked and I've been scorned, I had no idea what it meant to be buked. But I learned not through my own experience, but through the experience of that African-American spiritual, what it meant. I began to learn that black art matters. And those arts matter more today in 2021 than ever before. And that's why we've asked the Ensemble Theater to join us. Founded in 1976 by the late George Hawkins to preserve African-American artistic expression and to enlighten and entertain and enrich a diverse community. The Ensemble is one of the only professional theaters in the region dedicated to the production of works portraying the African-American experience, one of the oldest and the oldest and largest professional African-American theater in the, in, the, in the Southwest and reaches over 65,000 people annually. And so from the Ensemble Theater, we welcome Rachel Dixon, who has functioned as a professional artist for over 25 years, worked as an actor, director, playwright, dramaturg, uh, educator, producer, technical staff, and artistic consultant. She has worked with various theaters throughout the uh, Houston community and is the current president of Scriptwriters Houston, a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. We also welcome Eileen Morris, who is the artistic director um, she's directed over 87 productions, which include eight world premieres, and in January 2021 was awarded Broadway World Houston's Best Director of, decade, of the Decade for August Wilson's Fences. She has numerous directing credits, not only in Houston, but also in Pittsburgh, directing Pittsburgh's New Horizon Theater. She currently serves as Vice President of the Board of the Theater Communications Group and Chair of the Midtown Management District. And so we're really happy to welcome both Rachel and Eileen, I'm going to go ahead and end the slideshow and we're going to get right back to, let me just get back to a full screen and to our conversation. Rachel, Eileen, it's really wonderful to have both of you with us. Thank you for your time. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And first of all, um, was, it's so wonderful to be able to share this experience especially since we're neighbors right, right next door to each other. And uh, also to be able to, uh, on behalf of the Ensemble Theater's board and staff and artists, be able to have this shared conversation, which is really important and is a part of who we are at the Ensemble Theater. Super, thank you so much. Let's, again, we, uh, the, the Vital Conversations has a focus, but also is a, is, a, is, a, is a platform for people to learn more about these amazing and vital organizations doing vital work. So um, let's start by learning a little more. Can you tell us about the Ensemble Theater? What do you want people to know about your work and why is your work important? Just some small questions. <laughs> <laughs> small, yeah. Well, to, to start, you you know, we, we want you to know that we are here to serve our community and we do that through a sixth show main stage season. We are opening up in September with our uh, first production and we, we hope everyone comes out to enjoy that experience of being together with protocols in place, uh, but we will open our season uh, with respect in September and we'll have a six show season throughout the year. We also have training for young people six to 17 and we have some adult classes that will be coming up if they want to learn a little bit about the craft. Um, we welcome everyone through our training program, our young performers program and our main stage season. And then we have what we call celebrating the creative journey, which is a series of projects that aren't on our main stage, but it's an opportunity to experience the art and experience more about um, the culture. So we may have readings or films or like you, uh, uh, Interfaith Ministries, equity, diversity, and inclusion conversations where we connect the art to what it means to be invested in EDI or how, how those intersections happen. Uh, so we'll have more conversations in the fall. But those are a few of the things that we offer and we, we want everyone to know that we're here we're thriving and we, we want to be in space with you as soon as we can. <laughs> Absolutely. I think in addition to that, um, uh, Rachel, I'll just add that, you know, a huge part mm -hmm. of who the ensemble is, is being connected to our community because that's vitally important to us to be able to share and have a connectivity between community, between art, between the work that we do, which is why George Hawkins, our founder, 
you know, actually began the ensemble theater because he wanted to provide a place where African Americans and others could be able to enjoy, you know, the stories that are told. You, something that you said in, uh, you know, what connected you, Reverend Hahn, really touched mm -hmm. my spirit when you talked about being human and you talked about being one of only three people that were in the room. Well, you know, from an African American perspective, that's our world most times when we walk into the room and we're one, you know, we're one of very few that look like us, which is why the ensemble theater is so vitally important because of the fact that it's a place where, where you can see and share and experience stories that come from the African-American through the African-American lens. Maybe we could stop, I mean, and I, I'm kind of reversing direction here. So what was happening in 1976? Maybe starting in <laughs> Houston, starting, what was the context and why was it founded? And particularly at that point in time, what was missing that needed to be filled by the, the role of the ensemble theater? Wow, I mean, so much was missing, right? I mean, when you look at it during the 70s and around that time, you know, Rachel and I were talking about this just a few weeks ago, and even, you know, just a couple of days ago about the fact that during the 70s, that was the, uh, the Black Arts Movement. So the, so the Black Arts Movement was taking place because of the fact that artists, Black artists felt that there was, they didn't have a niche, they didn't have a place that they themselves could present their art in a way that would be acceptable for, for, by all people. So you got the Black Arts Movement and during that time, maybe, oh my gosh, 40 to 50 Black arts groups were being formulated and kind of, you know, began to come into fruition. Now, when you look back at those arts groups, out of those 50 plus groups that actually became, uh, you know, uh, became a part of the world, maybe 10 to 20 of them have, you know, not, you know, actually succeeded and actually been able to take part because either the founder passed or because of financial situation or just because the world changed. And then now when you, you know, you fast forward, Rachel and I were looking at the fact that the Black Seed, which is a national organization that has brought together various arts groups uh, that are of color, minority arts groups that are able to get funding. You know, now there's over like a hundred plus groups that have come together. Not all of them are institutions, but uh, many of them are actually gro groups that are either through individual you know, performances or group performances or associated with some kind of, you know, uh, higher learning educational aspect. But at least, you know, it's kind of a resurgence of that. So during the 70s, it was the Black Arts Movement that was driving these uh, institutions or individuals to create these institutions because they wanted a place where the voices could be heard. I think Rachel, you might want to add, you know, something to well, that. I mean, I, I, you you've cap encapsulated it beautifully, Eileen. That <clears throat> there was there was a funding opportunity. That's part of what happened in the '70s, right? Out of uh, the civil rights movement and into uh, supporting supporting the work that came out of that. Kind of like now, right? We had the the movement, George Floyd's uh, death, and then the Black Lives Matter movement that has grown and grown and since then uh, become a, a part of our community, there's funding in response to that. So the 70s and now very similar, uh, but, but the outcome is the same, right? Or groups who have felt oppressed and felt like they didn't have a voice are moving in a way that provides space for them to do that with Black, Black Lives Matter movement <laughs> where we are now and the Black Move, black arts movement of the 70s, right? Um, so, yeah. Let's maybe we could move. I I, I want to come back to a couple of other things about the about the theater. But I, again, I use the, fr the the phrase that black art matters, mm -hmm. um, and that's a kind of riffing off of Black Lives Matter. But again, it's it's a phrase that I think focuses on the importance of art and the unique lens of the black experience in America. But also, I, I think a message of 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 love, but also identity and resistance. Um, can you talk a little bit about why does Black art matter and how does the ensemble theater embody that mattering? Yeah, I mean, it. Oh, go on, Rachel. No, <laughs> we both inhaled, yes. Yep. <laughs> because that's, that's a wonderful question, Reverend Hahn, a wonderful question. It matters, and I'll be brief, because it, 
say it simply, it matters because we are telling the American story, right? Yeah. African-Americans are part of the fabric of this country. We, we are here and have contributed to this existence. And the art that we produce, not only does it give us a voice to communicate happenings through the African-American lens, which is one of the most important things, right? But we also are telling the story of all people, yeah. right? When you, went to the, when you went to the choir rehearsal, those were your songs you discovered. It's the yeah. very same with the pieces that we are presenting with the yeah. work that we do in the community. Right, like like you discovered, Reverend Han, that community, that choir embraced you. As do we embrace <laughs> uh, all of the stories that come forth, all of the artists that come forth. Uh, our art matters because it it gives voice and provides space for anyone who's willing to embrace it. Yeah, and it and it matters because we matter. I, I mean, I, I really you know take that to heart because. We are human beings that are, you know, are culturally specific human beings that are thrust into this world of, 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 you know, of Europeans, of black and brown, of diversity, of so many different, you know, aspects. And we matter as a result of that. When you think about the work that the ensemble theater does, the plays that are chosen, you know, that's why I said earlier is that our work every day, you know, we're ingrained in this work. This is a part of who we are. So we're not just doing a play to do a play. I mean, that, you know, there are plays, even those plays that are, you know, purely entertainment, there's still an aspect of who we are culturally and what we've been affected with and why we need to, why that needs to be presented. So I'll give you this an example. Uh, and so um, one Sunday afternoon, uh, when we did have a Houston critic in the, uh, in the, in the greater Houston area, Everett Evans was the theater critic for the Houston Chronicle. And Everett was so gracious because he always came to see everything that every theater company pretty much in the city of Houston was going to be doing. So he had a wide and vast knowledge of what was going on and what was specific to that particular institution. This particular Sunday afternoon when he came to see the ensemble play, I happened to be there in the audience and the play was David Mamet's Race. So now David Mamet is not, is a, uh, you know, European, Caucasian playwright, male playwright. And, but this play, Race, dealt with a subject matter that dealt with someone that had been, you know, uh, not incarcerated, but was being tried because of something that had been done. And, you know, and then these, all of these different entities were coming together. And so for us, it, we felt like it really was something that needed to be told from the African-American experience because of the fact that that was a world that we lived in and we, who better to express that than, you know, the ensemble theater. So when it was intermission, he came out and he looked at me from across the lobby and he, you know, and I, you know, that was in a way for me to come over and have a conversation with him. And he said, Eileen, he said, what would we do if we didn't have the ensemble theater? He said, I don't know what we would do. These kinds of plays will be told from a different perspective and not always necessarily from, it would be the truth of that particular group, but not the truth from a group that has lived and breathed, you know, that experience. And that really touched me when he said that. And another thing that kind of, I think about is another story. And Rachel, you, you know, you might want to share this one. <laughs> the other extreme was somebody with even more power than Everett Evans was a little girl who came to see Cinderella when we were doing it. Now she's what, eight, eight years old. And she said, after the show, she said, mommy, that princess looks like me. Mm. So to that, what else can matter besides allowing people to see themselves? And they say art imitates life, life imitates art, whichever is true, there's an ongoing debate. We know that the stories we tell reflect, reflects a world that people are moving in and they deserve to see themselves. So uh, when she said that in that story was told to us, and another example is a woman who was a hundred years old saw a show that we did from Port Society. She said, it, after the show, she said, I know those people, that was my house. Mm -hmm. And so that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it may have been one of her first times at the theater. Right. So pretty, pretty powerful. Let's us know that we matter. Yeah. yeah, which is why Mr. Hawkins actually founded the theater because when he was, you know, he was an actor at first, 
And uh, so he was acting and but he was acting at, you know, other places that but there were places that where his voice wasn't the primary voice. And he wanted to be able to have a place where the voice of, you know, that of the stories that he knew could be primary and they could be, you know, enriched and told and talked about and shared from a global perspective. How, let me, let, let me, there's, there's so many things I want to touch on, but I want to, and, and I'm going to try to connect these a little bit. Um, often with our vital conversations, we've talked in the past with people working on either, you know, maybe working on issues and with policy, like with our, our conversation last month with Link Houston about transportation policy, or with the Houston Education Research Consortium about, um, about education policy. Can you talk to me a little bit about how art can change, how your experience with how art changes things um, with, with the change that you're seeking to bring into the community? Um, it's all, you know, it's a little different kind than, you know, marching down to city hall and saying something about the I-45 project, though art may have something to say about that in a very powerful way. Uh, um, maybe in me, maybe even more powerful because of the role of story. So, um, can you maybe reflect with me a little bit on, um, the power of, 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 of how you see art making change? One person at a time. Reverend Han, yes. you started yes. with your story of, yes. why, of going into that choir rehearsal. That changed you. And sometimes those seeds are not unearthed until later. But I know so many artists who and say, art changed my life. Mm. It saved me. And when those artists present their pieces for an audience of folks, no, that audience member may not be moved to exit the theater and go straight to Washington or Austin, right? Yeah. But they will be moved to think about further, to perhaps support a little bit more, to perhaps speak up about. Uh, so those, those tiny changes add together to make the powerful change that we need in the world. And there are arts groups who are doing the theater that is about specific, they focus, they say they are social justice with the point of, right? But we know that all art really does that. Yeah, Ours yeah. included, even though we don't start out saying we're gonna do some social justice theater, but <laughs> all of our art is social justice art. And, and in doing social justice work, you're planting seeds one seed at a time. Yeah. yeah. That was such a beautiful way of saying it, Rachel. I mean, it's about that human being and what's how they're being affected by the art that we present each and every day. You could take any subject matter of a play and you could you could look at uh, talk to that actor that's presenting it and talk about what you know changed or how they were affected by that. You could talk to an audience member and ask them if they're being honest, if they're being transparent about how they were affected by that piece of art that they witnessed or experienced and the good, the bad and the ugly, whatever that is, you could talk about all those aspects. And I think that's the beauty of what art is because it's a shared, it's a shared experience that everybody mm -hmm. has. You know, it may not be the same because you're coming from it, from your come from it, from, you know, how mm -hmm. you were raised in the world and how, what your parents instilled upon you. That's how you're looking at it initially. But then what happens is that as you begin to look and have that experience, things get peeled back, certain, you know, certain feelings come into play. And then there's the connectivity that happens with human beings from artists to audience. That's the beauty of what the art is mm. that, you know, just gives me goosebumps when I think about, you know, what that means to be able to have that experience with your, with your audience and with, you know, you know, the entities that come together in that room, in that, in that, you know, when that room it becomes dark and there's nobody watching me, but I'm, we're all watching this experience on stage. Right, I like to say it's no longer, it's not a transaction, it's transformational because yes. once we're in space together, we're being real intimate. I said that the last process I worked on, I said, okay, you guys, we're gonna be intimate together today because you're sharing breath. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Again, we're talking with Rachel Dixon and Eileen Morris from the Ensemble Theater. If you're on Facebook, please post if you want to ask questions. And I also, with the, the, the 30 of us that are here in the Zoom, please take advantage of the chat box to, uh, to, uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, you can see Valencia Edner posted, the power of Art Express transforms people. It's church reaching the heart through the eyes, ears, and spirit stories. Bravo, Ensemble, speak to us. Um, let me ask a little bit about, again, the Ensemble Theater existed, and you have been artists long before the death of George Floyd in 2020, and there have been many opportunities uh, and, and, and tragic instances that have illustrated the, the, the inequalities in, in American life. But just, uh, there, there, there seemed to be a potential sea change in that summer of 2020. I, I'm curious if either people coming to the ensemble or interest in the ensemble or your understanding of the role of the ensemble theater has changed at certain points since 1976? And in particular, if you found it has changed since, um, again, since the murder of George Floyd uh, a little more than a year ago. I think one of the things that for us has, uh, that we as a, an, an institution and staff, you know, board to artists talk about more than we probably talked about in recent years, I would say, is that, um, because of the murder of George Floyd and because of the impact that that made on us, first of all, as culturally specific black and brown people, you know, having that experience and understanding what that means, understanding, you know, the fact that we have to continue to have those conversations with the young people, the people in our lives about what to do in situations such as that. How do we heal from that? How do we, um, you know, make sure that we get an opportunity to, to talk about it so that we can move forth is that we have to continue that and that, and that, you know, whereas before we were just, the art was, we were doing the art. We were having dialogue exchanges after a production and talking about it and having shared experience. Now we understand, well, we, well, we're, well maybe I should say we're more animate about the fact that we have to be really, um, uh, strong-willed about mm -hmm. making sure that the conversations happen, that that mm -hmm. our audiences understand why we're doing the art that we're doing, why it's important that this type of play be done at the Ensemble Theater, why this particular story needs to be told at this time. For instance, like we're going to be doing a play this year, two plays I would just bring up. One is about one of your three amigos, Reverend William A. Lawson, and, uh, you know, and, and Mrs. Audrey Lawson. And a lot of people, you know, under, know about Reverend Lawson because he's founder of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. He has, you know, such a vast knowledge and information and shared, you know, experience that he has had in Houston. But, you know, they were really a part of the civil rights movement that happened in the 60s and 70s. Reverend, and, Reverend Lawson and Mrs. Audrey, you know, Audrey uh, Watson Lawson, uh, Audrey Watson Lawson. And so just knowing that information, that's one thing. Two, we're doing another play called Brother Toad uh, by Nathan Lewis Jackson. And that play is dealing with gun violence. And so, you know, people will be like, why are you doing a play about that? Well, it's important that we help our community to understand what stories, what is going on in the world, how these stories are affecting our community, how they're affecting the entire world, because gun violence is something that you know, pertains to all of us, that affects each and every one of us. That's why we always say that our stories are universal stories. Yeah. They're just, you know, told from the African-American experience. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's one idea. Thank you. Yeah. Rachel, do you have any, please, I would love it if you could want to add, have any, want to contribute to that, to that as well about, again, how particularly the past 14 months, how you have experienced the role or the perception of the ensemble theater you, you, uh, changing within the community? Uh, changing, I don't know that we're, yes, I agree with Eileen, being deliberate and conscious about conversation has become more of a theme for us. Uh, uh, providing a space I think we have be moved to a space to support other organizations yeah. who may need that 
conversation to happen, right? Other theaters or other arts groups that need a voice, they yeah. reach out and we provide that for them. Um, I think as we move on, it'll be a space of healing more than mm -hmm. perhaps we've thought of it in the past, right? Uh, I, I know that when I am reading a play now mm -hmm. and it's connected to the, uh, the theater, how content resonates with me is very, very different. And it makes me call up one of my colleagues and say, hey, what do you think about it? Like, let us have this conversation. So uh, I anticipate we will move even further in that direction, right? Having those conversations about the work and what our responsibility is to the work and how the work affects us. We can't, I, I don't know, I can't say anymore in a play, so-and-so died and it just be yeah. that. It's not, it's, it's not ever going to be just that again, especially if depending on the circumstances. So yeah. um, providing that healing space, I think is something we'll move even further into. Right. Yeah, and I think too, I think a good point, Don, excuse me, Reverend Hahn, yeah. I think a great point is when you talked about healing, Rachel, because yeah. that's an aspect that a lot of times, you know, people think, well, that takes place. You know, I think what happens is that people want to pigeonhole or put things in certain aspects of, okay, I'm going to heal now. I'm going to go to therapy now. I'm going to do this now opposed to understanding that art has, that's the blessing of what art does for each and, each and every one of us. It takes us through all of those different emotions and journeys because it is healing, it is nurturing, it is transparent. It does, you know, connect, it's, it is connectivity, it is community, it is, it is a part of who you are. You just might not express it in that way. That's why we always say there's a little bit of artists in everybody, right? Yeah. Because we all have to, you know, there's a way that we, you know, look at ourselves and look at how we view things. But healing, I think, is hugely important, even more so in our journey, especially because of the this past, not just George Floyd, but just all of the things that we're having to go through because of COVID and what has happened with us as a, as a, we were all uniformed in that thing, right? Yeah. There was no, yeah. it didn't matter what, what your ethnicity was, what your age was, what your gender was. We were all connected. It brings tears to my eyes to think about yeah. it. We were all connected in a way that we all had a shared experience. And you know, I, I would be remiss, Reverend Hahn, if I didn't mention, since uh, the, uh, the killing of George Floyd, we've had a few residencies with young people. Residencies meaning we mm. go into the school or the institution or, and work with young people. And we were much more deliberate about having the young people write their own work yeah. and speak to their feelings. Between George Floyd and COVID, <laughs> we felt like giving them that opportunity to express their fears, their concerns, and creating art around it so they can see the value of art, back to one of your earlier questions. Uh, so that has been really, really, really powerful to see what they what they create and no, then to see no. their movement in response to their creations. Just That's amazing, more. amazing, amazing. Um, I want to ask in a, a, a maybe a slightly personal question. You um, you talked uh, mentioned a, a second the artist in each of us, and it's not just about the art, but the artist. And I'm wondering if you'd be able to share just a little bit about being your both of your artists and women and uh, and, and women of color. How did you how did you come to 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 the performing arts? What spoke about it to you, and what is kept you in this space for you know for for, for these many years <laughs> mm. Eileen yeah. let me just I'll, I'll put you on the spot first well, you know. <laughs> I think and we always have to breathe when we hear questions that really uh, uh, you know kind of capture our heart pull at our heartstrings because it's you know I mean for Rachel and I both and but I'm going to speak for Eileen it's just it's a part of who I am I always look at my art as my my ministry mm. um, and who, uh, you know, what I've been called to do, right? Uh, but I, I went to Catholic schools all my life and I've, you know, those who have known me have heard this story. And so I went to Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. And up until fifth grade, I wanted to be a nun. And that, you know, somehow changed. I keep telling everybody my, you know, hormones kicked in. I started wearing glasses, who knows, right? Uh, but I really <laughs> always felt that I wanted to be connected to the community, connected to human beings, 
being able to express myself in a way. And I really started doing theater at that time. Got, you know, fast forward. The thing is, is that, you know, I was in a school where there was only a couple that looked like me. So they couldn't see me being Snow White or playing, mm-hmm. you know, in a play that that traditionally was for, you know, someone of European descent. And so, you know, you have to fight and claw and prove your way, prove that you're worthy and that you're talented enough and can do the work. And so for me, the, my art has always been, it's always been a part of who I am. It's been a part of the fact that I'm able to express myself as a, as a, uh, as a black female. I've been able to learn more about who I am because of my art, through the art that it you know, is being presented. And I just, I love it. I love being able to, so as an actress, I love that because I was an actress. I've always been an actress, uh, even though I don't get to perform much as much anymore because of my responsibilities and the time, you know, constraints that, you know, fall upon at the ensemble theater, but I still mm-hmm. get to, you know, some things occasionally. And then as a director, because you're, you're delving into so many different aspects when you do this work and you're getting an opportunity to kind of mold and shape and have conversations and talk about and dissect and pull apart and enjoy and, and you know, have this delicious experience through your art. So for me, it's a part of, I, I know I've been blessed to be able to, to do the art that we're, you know, doing each and every day and will continue to do. Um, and, you know, I don't see, you I look at an August Wilson play where a character may be in her 20s and then in that same play, there's a character in their 50s or 60s and I go, oh, wow. You know, I could do that play because I did it when I was younger and I could do it now that I'm older. That's the kind of beauty of what art is. If you're able to memorize a line or read a script or, you know, dissect the character, you could do it at any age. Ah. That's the beauty of it. And it you. doesn't require training or the history. If it's something you ever thought you wanted to try, it's so worth it. Yeah. So How about you, Rachel? What what brought you to 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 to, to the arts? Oh, uh, you know, there were a few things along the way that brought me to the arts. I remember seeing my sister in a pageant. You know, those were real popular back in the, <laughs> back in the early 80s. And um, <clears throat> she did a monologue or something. And I, I was like, I, I want to do that partially because she did it. But that was my first introduction to, oh, this is something, right? Because you remember, right? We didn't have TV with a bunch of channels. And even if you did, there were very few shows. So I didn't, that was not my representation. But when I saw my sister, I thought, oh, that's something people can do. Maybe I'll try. (laughs) Um, So that was the start. And then, you know, along the way, experiences with the craft, I realized now were were a part of just pushing me forward, being in a play in fifth grade and being really upset that my, I was the queen, my king was who he was. I was like, so distraught about that. And then (laughs) crying because I got cast as a munchkin. I cried for about a week, but I got cast as a munchkin instead of Dorothy. I was just devastated. <laughs> uh, but at all of that time, I never thought I, I want to be an actor because, you know, a lot of Africans still today, a lot of um, black and brown families say you can't do that. It's not going to make you money. You got to have a money making job. Um, and then <laughs> uh, in high school, I, uh, he it, it was never said, but it was understood you can't audition for this. Same as Miss Eileen, mm. right? And mm-hmm. I, I went kind to of that uns, that unspoken rule, unspoken, huh? right? And mm. my theater teacher said it doesn't matter what he says, you can do this, this, and this. And then you know, I went to school for engineering in college, and my mother died while I was in college, and that was the the, the kicker for me that said I need to do, and I encourage people do what you feel like you need to do, if you're called to do it, if you, and for me, like, like Miss Eileen, I am called to, to create, um, mm-hmm. to, to engage people, to help people think, move, feel. I'm a believer, you have an idea, whether that's as an actor or a writer or a director, and then that idea, you, you get the people engaged to make it happen, and then you're creating art, and that's as close as we're going to get to God, right, mm-hmm. is creating. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, I, that, that is what, what got me here and what has kept me here is just believing I have a voice. Oh. And, I think and you, I to grow. Oh, no. I'm yeah. sorry, Rachel. I was just, okay, I just, got excited when you said that about, you know, the different entities that come together, because I mean, that's why part of the ensemble's name, ensemble, it's a group of people coming together to create, to do things. I love that process. <laughs> You know, when you're bringing together all of those designers that have all these, they're reading, we're all coming from the same Bible, right? 
which is our script. It's the same text that we, but we're all coming from it with different perspectives because you're using your knowledge and your, uh, what you're, again, I'll say this word, come from it is, and you're putting that together, but you're taking all of these pieces together to create the one piece that's gonna be shared with your audience. That's a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah. And again, I, and I would imagine, again, thinking about the, 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 the history of the Black experience in, in America, that having avenues for creation and for expression, and in many ways, um, it, again, this multi-layered and often a subversive message. I remember, I, I remember some of the spirituals that we sang had multiple layers and multiple codes uh, that maybe meant something on the on the outside, but to yes. the to the community, it said something far far more different and maybe far more encouraging as well. So, let, let me let, let's turn then to. Um, the ensemble season. I, I love that you look to have themes for seasons at the ensemble theater. And again, one of the reasons that we titled this conversation "Indomitable Spirit" is that this—that's the—that's the the theme of the season coming up. Um, can you share more about why you chose that title and give us a little taste of of, of what's going to be part of that theme? Well, in talking about the title, we, of course, bounced around, as we always do, several different options. And Indomitable Spirit, Miss Eileen, it kind of held on to her. So <laughs> uh, but it is, a, we, we agree, right? The ensemble has been here. The ensemble is here and, and survived through COVID. And a lot of theaters didn't. And we believe we'll be here to have this conversation again in 20, 30 years, right? So just indomitable meaning you, we, we cannot be beaten. We, we are perceived pro going forth, knowing that we have something to do and we cannot be beaten. And then the, the spirit is right. The, the spirit of the craft, the spirit of our ancestors are with us. Yes. And <laughs> I say, yes, we are all mm. um, working together with a, with a, uh, a churning from the inside that keeps us moving forward. So indomitable spirit is about that. And that's what we uh, are, uh, know coming out of COVID, coming uh, out of and with the Black Lives Matter movement, a part of what we're doing this year, we are going to go forth and be strong in spirit and, and do good work. And if our actual completed um, uh, season is indomitable spirit, colon, uh, let me make sure I get it right, tenaciously, empowered together oh, or together okay. empowered tenaciously but no, it's no, no. T -E -T. okay <laughs> t-e-t right that's that's who we are the ensemble theater and so we know that you know we have to have the drive we have to do it together here where the ensemble theater the where the e is for everyone and everyone counts and it's mm. part of our phrase right and and um we are empowered to just move forward so i think that, also yeah. We, we, you know, when you think about that, we're celebrating 45 years. This is our 45th anniversary season. And uh, Reverend Han, first of all, we're grateful that the community has supported us throughout the years. We're grateful to be, you know, standing as the oldest, uh, you know, the oldest arts entity in Midtown. And Mid, for those of you that don't know, uh, Midtown is, the, uh, is also a uh, cultural arts district designated by the Texas Commission on the Arts oh, maybe about nine years ago. And so the Ensemble Theater was very much a part of, you know, them getting that designation because of the fact of our history and the legacy that we have. So when you think about 45 years, when you think about the, all of the plays that we're doing for this particular season, and you think about each one of those uh, kind of themes of that particular play has its own indomitable spirit, its own tenaciousness, its own empowerment, and its own sense of togetherness, that's another way that we, you know, choose the theme because it's based upon and it's layered with the theme of the of all of the plays that are being done. But all of it, you know, is a part of the community that we serve each yeah. and every day. That 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 really is what empowers us to do the work that we do and brings us such joy. I just want to highlight a couple of um, 
of comments in the chat box. Gorgeous conversation. You're speaking to my soul. Thank you to the Ensemble Theater as an implant uh, or to the Houston area and a new employee here at Interfaith Conversations. So enlightening. I had no idea what the Ensemble did uh, and how it has impacted the community. So um, you have you have quite a few fans here in the in in the room with us. Um, two questions. Um, what are your challenges right now? But I also uh, want to ask, what is maybe some success stories as well? So maybe start first. What do you see as the challenges right now for the ensemble or maybe within the arts community? Uh, and then we can switch to uh, talking about um, uh, your um, what success looks like, maybe some success stories about uh, about the ensemble theater. Mm. Uh, maybe what are challenges or just more, uh, you know, challenges that become opportunities, right? So um, I think that for all of us that are getting ready to, uh, you know, begin to embark on opening up, maybe that's even just a very kind of raw, transparent way of, you know, saying it, but just the fact that we're to begin to take a leap and a leap of faith into the back into the world to be able to bring the art, you know, to our community is going to be a challenge. Just getting our and helping uh, for ourselves to actually, you know, be able to implement all of the CDC guidelines and and you know COVID compliances that need to be done for the safety of our artists, our staff, and our patrons. Those are going to be opportunities that we're going to be, you know, um, looking at. And because things are changing every day. That's the, I think that's the big challenge is because it's not, there's so much uncertainty amongst things that are going on in that vein. That would be one kind of thing that I would think about. And then for us, uh, our uh, um, um, previous managing director, Ms. Jeanette Cosley had retired um, this past October. And so we're gonna be introducing a new um, managing director to our community, which is great. And we're very excited about that. But just the fact that, you know, with Jeanette's longevity and history, she had been with the theater for uh, 17 years. Yeah. So, you know, just making those adjustments in with our community, with funders, with staffing, uh, you know, that's another opportunity that we're going to be having to reintroduce someone to the community and getting them involved and letting them know, hey, we are still here, despite all of the challenges that we had with COVID. And we did have to do some furloughs. We've been able to bring people back on to staff, we've been able to continue. We uh, did not close the doors. Those of us that remained on payroll were still able to have a job. Those are hugely important, wonderful things that because of our community, because of the funders that support the Ensemble Theater, we've been able to continue to do. Super, thank you. I think uh, an additional uh, challenge though, I love how you put it, Miss Eileen, that it's a, an opportunity really uh, is, <laughs> The, the burgeoning of funding and support of black and brown right now, the, the, the optimism that it will maintain. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yes. Because yes. there's, there's lots of support right now, which is wonderful, wonderful. And, and, and it, I agree, it's an opportunity. But where will that be in a year? Right? Because we've seen the swing in the tide happen many times. Yes. The hope is that it will, it will maintain and the, the, entities that have been able to sustain because of that support will still have that support in a year and will have taken those the challenge that is coming and prepared in order to turn it into an opportunity. I think something else that is a challenge is right as as uh, I mean, mentioned COVID with schools right we don't know what's happening with schools and so much of our work is about the young people that we serve. It's about going into schools and doing shows for children and having residencies and having conversations with teachers and kiddos. And what does that look like? We don't know. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's the, oh, I'm sorry, Eileen. Did, um, no, no, I, no. I, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, just another couple of things is, believe it or not, you know, because of, uh, of all the things that have happened with COVID and you hear, we've heard a lot about teachers saying that, you know, I'm not going to teach anymore and they retired or something like that. Well, we've had just, you know, we planned a season based on artists that we know would possibly be able to partake and be a part of it. Some of those artists have moved out or moving out of state or had moved. Some of them are like several of our artists are pregnant. Uh, and so then that kind of is a change for us that, you know, we're having to adjust 
what we thought we would be able to depend on and you know kind of look back and just finding new artists in the community to be a part of the work that we do you know me and maybe I, I know that I wanted to ask about success stories, but I think this whole Cavado conversation has been about your, the, the wonderful success. Maybe that's a good segue to talk about what can people do? Rachel, you mentioned that the hope of, uh, or, or both the hope and the concern about the sustain, the, the, the being able to sustain the support into black and brown arts communities. So um, people turn tune into these vital conversations to learn more about vital issues and especially what they can do. What can people people do to support the ensemble theater and your role in supporting, I think, again, the, the importance of Black, uh, of arts in the Black community and the Black experience? Well, of course, the most immediate, Reverend Han, that comes to mind that all of us are thinking about is support theater, go to theater, see theater, uh, give, give dollars to theater, right? Um, support in ways that can be maintained beyond your, your, your hearedness, right? There are ways to endow your theater that you love so much with yep. funds yep. after you've passed and I'll support theater and come and see theater. That's the most, the, the, the biggest immediate piece. Um, introducing children to theater, right? Because we know the average audience age is getting older. And if we don't get young people 30 and younger to, to see the value and they can stay home and watch Netflix and Hulu and all of that, right? But if they don't see the value, then theater, will have some danger, right? It'll, it'll have to ch change a whole lot to reflect, to, to, to engage with what is if our audience continues to get older. So that, that's a starting place. Yeah, and I think we have to be strategic about, uh, you know, our audiences need to be uh, those that are wanting to get introduced to the theater, be strategic about it. So like, if you know you work for a company that, you know, has a matching gift plan, you know, donate something and have that matching gift so that your gift becomes even more of a contribution to the theater. Also, maybe if there's an opportunity for us to be able to be introduced to the, your place of employment, that's always great because we love, part of what we do, part of what we love so very much is the different ways that we go out and reach into the community. I mean, we can go and do some theme, you know, presented situation and create art out of that theme. Or we can go to a school and come in and engage and talk with students about something that they're studying or reading in their English class. You know, so we can be specific. We can specifically work towards something with, you know, a particular audience member. And I think it's important that audiences begin to introduce us to these varied uh, groups that they're in so that we will have new audiences that can become a part of the ensemble theater. That's why we say, where the ensemble theater, where the E is for everyone and everyone counts. So many of us have brought other people to uh, the theater because we're introducing them. We have several board members that do that consistently mm -hmm. where they'll bring new people to the theater and they'll buy their tickets for them so that they can be introduced. So we say introduce people to what the ensemble theater has to offer. Ask one of us to come out and talk to a specific group at your job or church or community center Whatever that is, we're really wanting to be engaged with our community because that's where, you know, the legacy and the longevity of who we are as an institution will continue to, uh, you know, to exist. Someone mentioned in the chat our senior matinees, and I, I'm so so excited that there are folks who love those because we we enjoy those as well. Where sometimes we'll have seniors and um, students together in the audience, right? And, and we'll be even more deliberate about the conversations that those two groups have, right? But it, it's, it's beautiful to see um, everybody from the little to the big in, in the space, right? And, and then one more thing I think folks can do is when you hear about, especially if this is your wheelhouse, for a lot of us, it's not. But when you hear about House bills and Senate bills and the policy that you yeah. mentioned, Reverend Han, happening around the support of arts, Make your voice be heard. Send your letter, do the call, Google or research. How do I support this house bill if you don't know how? Because I, I didn't know how and it's still not my strength, but yeah. it matters. All of the people who support, you know, having moved in their circles here in Houston that, that they focus on advocacy for arts and watching how they work when they say, we did this because you sent a message is, is really powerful.
That's that's an important and, and I know we could have a whole other conversation about <laughs> the the culture and policy of how arts get funded here in the greater Houston area by various foundations and alliances. And um, uh, and and hopefully, again, my guess is, is that they have probably not been uh, equitable or in the past and but hopefully are improving. But that's probably a whole other other conversation. Um perhaps to be had at, at, at another time. Um, but just want to, I think, want to raise that consciousness and awareness to those who are listening, that it's just not about um, that, that be, besides, I think, bills and policies, but there's all whole f- kind of funding kind of culture or kind of in um, uh, kind of infrastructure here in Houston as well, that that needs to that that people need to be aware of. Um, I, there's some questions in the chat about maybe a little bit about um, when 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 opening is. Um, I, again, I encourage people to go to ensemblehouston.com. But um, when opening show is and um, things that you're thinking about when it comes to uh, to to how many people you're going to have in with again the, the the changing the changing atmosphere, the changing landscape of COVID. But really, when 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 will things open up and when when would be able we be able to come down to the theater? Right. Well, we start rehearsals next Tuesday, August 17th, with the play Respect, Uh, not based on the movie, but, you know, it definitely has Aretha Franklin, you know, a couple of songs in the in the play itself. But it deals with uh, um, the empowerment of women and uh, written by Dr. Dorothy Marsick, directed uh, directed uh, by Tony Glover, who's a a well-known local um, HSPVA graduate and uh, Houstonian artist. So that star actually opens on September 23rd, I believe is the date that we actually open. That play will run until October 17th. And so what we're gonna be doing for the first play of the season is we're actually going to have limited audiences that will be able to attend the show. So it will be live. We will follow again, CDC guidelines and uh, uh, regulations. We um, will have things in place that audiences will know about by visiting our website or going on, you know, getting the information uh, from the ensemble theater, but we'll have limited audiences for the first show. Also that first show will be a show without intermission. So once you come into the theater and get seated, then you, you know, when you, when the show ends, then that will be the end of that play. It'll be like an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 30 minute performance that will be seen. So that will help us to kind of reduce uh, interaction amongst people and audiences and crowds and that kind of thing until things settle down. We plan on doing that for the first show, uh, everybody. And then for the second play, Motown, uh, Motown Christmas, uh, then we'll, we're, we're going to evaluate that probably midway of the first show respect to see if we can open up a little bit more with audiences and be able to have close to you know, a regular, our, our theater is very intimate, but it seats mm-hmm. 190. So the, the beauty that people love about what the ensemble theater provides is that, you know, you feel like you're right there with the actors on stage. The intimacy is so strong, yet it's a large space. It's a 190 seat house. So we're looking to open that up a little bit more for the holiday, you know, Christmas show. So that's really what we're going to be putting in place. We'll still be doing some aspects uh, virtually. Rachel, you might want to talk about that some of the virtual things that we'll do, and then a few other in-person things that we'll do with small audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be moving with a conversation in September, an equity, diversity, inclusion conversation uh, right now that will be in uh, in collaboration with another theater. So we're looking forward to see what that is and talking about some form of intersectionality, which hasn't been fully distilled, but that will be a virtual conversation that happens. Uh, we'll be having an acting class coming up in uh, September as well. So if you are an adult and thought about taking an acting class, or you, even if you're seasoned and want to get that muscle moving, since we've all kind of been on a break for a while, yep, then yep. that could be a good class. And it is also virtual. Now we're and just like with the shows, we're planning to increase and become more face-to-face as the year goes on. So the next acting class will be face-to-face and the next few um, conversations will be in person. Uh, so yeah, and you know, moving into the the, the year, Miss Eileen, you mentioned already the Lawsons. I'm terribly excited about oh, that. By Mel DeBay, it's a world premiere musical and to tell the story of Reverend Lawson and this 
it's Audrey Lawson. I, I, it, I think it's going to be really dynamic, right? It's a, it's a play with music, but it has several songs and the cast is really fabulous of all of our shows this year. Uh, we're really excited to see the work that they bring to, to the stage. And that opens uh, uh, the end of, no, yes, the end of January, January 24th, right? Um, so we're looking forward to moving into the year with some really exciting work. That is mm -hmm. Rachel Dixon, Eileen J. Morris. I wish I had a whole other hour, but we've come <laughs> to the end. Um, so I wanted to thank you. Let me just have a couple of closing um, announcements. Again, we hope to see you um, for our September conversation with Project Curate. Um, but before then, we hope you can join us or continue to join us for our dialogue workshops at Interfaith Ministries. We're hosting in partnership with an organization called Braver Angels. Uh, so, so please uh, visit. Uh, I've got a slide here, but I will. Uh, I, if you'll visit imgh.org and go to events and our dialogue workshops, uh, we would really hope that you would join us. We've got one on September 28th and one on November 9th. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, you can learn more about the Ensemble Theater at EnsembleHouston.com, and you can visit us at IMGH.org to learn more about Interfaith's work. Again, thank you to Sitco Petroleum Corporation for sponsoring this episode and the entire series. Rachel, Eileen, thank yeah. you so much again, and uh, look forward to getting to the Ensemble Theater to see a show this fall. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Hahn. We appreciate it. Thank you, audience. All right. Thanks, everyone. Awesome.